I've been a primary author of two of the largest tax cuts in the history of our state. Let the eagle soar. Son, go outside and dust yourself off. And when you feel good again, come back in and talk to me. We know what they would have done because we know what they did. Hey, bro. What I am trying to do to simply make tomorrow just a little bit better than today. This is Rachel Herndon Dunn, editor of the Missouri Times, here with today's co-host, Ben Peters, on the hashtag MoLedge podcast, sponsored by the St. Louis Regional Chamber of Commerce. We're going to do things a little bit differently today um, from our typical format. Yesterday we talked to Wes Sutton, and today we are talking to one of the architects of victory of SD8, Joe Lakin. Welcome, Joe. Thanks for having me. So, uh, the race was kind of interesting. Not only was it a special election, but you kind of had um, special competition with a special <laughs> strategy. Um, is that what you expected to get out of opposition? Uh, it's certainly not. Um, <laughs> you know, w- on uh, on August, I believe it was the fifteenth. Mike Searpoy won uh, the the Republican nomination, and at that point, we assumed. Um, that, that he would be the Republican. I believe the Democrats had already nominated Hillary Shields. And so we sort of anticipated that that's what the race was going to look like. And, and really within about a week, we picked up that uh, Jacob Turk was interested or had begun gathering uh, signatures. <clears throat> Once we found that out, uh, you know, the threshold was only 629 signatures. Uh, and, and we felt because he had run in that congressional district so many times, um, had some grassroots support, that, that was a threshold he was very likely uh, to achieve. And he had really from the date uh, Sirapoy received the nomination to when those were required to be turned in almost 30 days. And so it was our it was really our expectation at that point that he was very likely uh, to be on the ballot as well. Uh, I thought it was really interesting. I'm from Senate District 8. And I'm from Kansas City. Um, like, as soon as I graduated from high school, I moved from Lee Summit to downtown Kansas City. Same year of redistricting. And so it's interesting, like, Turk has run for Congress six times. And the district has literally changed um, since he's been running. So it went from being mostly Kansas City to now it stretches oddly across Jackson County and even includes a little bit, like, Ray County. Yeah, like go, it, go, it, it stretches. It, yeah, it actually goes all the way to Saline now. Includes Marshall. It's, um... Not gerrymandering at all. No. No, not at all. <laughs> um, so not only did you have Jacob Turk, you had Hillary Shields, and she ran a pretty creative campaign. Not only did the Jackson County Executive Director gather signatures for Jacob Turk, but Hillary Shields sent out a mailer that was all like, Jacob Turk is too conservative. Jacob Turk, Jacob Turk, Jacob Turk. W- was that kind of a... Um, what's what's the sports metaphor here, Ben? What, uh, a curveball was that a curveball you were <laughs> you were expecting? <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it sort of it certainly was a a bit of a curveball, although uh, we we expected it. Um, y- you know, from the very beginning of this, um, <clears throat> we suspected that there were Democrats helping him collect signatures. Now, the question uh, <laughs> that that he states is that he didn't know that, but certainly. Uh, throughout the process, he was receiving significant support from Democrats. You had a uh, prominent Democrat attorney from mid-Missouri who was a candidate, is a candidate, now worked for Coster, Carnahan, and Kander, uh, represents him in the court case. Uh, that was sort of the first hard proof we had. Then you had the revelation that her husband had actually signed the petition. and in. Turk sort of famously said when that came out that, you know, of course I appeal to all sorts of Democrats. These people are probably voting for me because of my values. Well, um, I, I don't think Mitch Shields was probably going to vote for Jacob Turk. <laughs> and then, um, literally, these stories are coming out, and, and it probably looked, you know, coordinated by our campaign to, you know, drip these stories out. Literally, we were feeding them out as we were learning them. I mean, there are, you know, hundreds of pages of petitions to go through. So we're go- literally going through them. So then, the next thing we found was that the uh, executive director of the Democrat Party, I believe a paid position over there, had uh, been a signed affidavit petition signature gatherer and collected, I think, six pages and 44 signatures. And so, you know, we had all those things. There were also a number of 
uh, donors to her campaign that were also signers. So yeah, I mean, it, this was something that um, we sort of saw, <coughs> we sensed their fingerprints early on and then certainly realized it as the cam campaign went on. And, and really it became sort of a cornerstone of what we talked about that, um, you know, this was a, an instance where they're both involved in dirty politics. It was very uh, closely covered by the media in the region, Missouri Times, and also the Kansas City Star, KNBC did pieces on this. And so, you know, at the very end, you saw those pieces come out where they were calling him too conservative. You know, it obviously harkens back to the 2012 U.S. Senate primary with Claire McCaskill and Todd Aiken. And so something certainly we anticipated would occur, but I think at that point he was probably too far out of the race to uh, for it to make any difference. I always think it's funny whenever there's a opposition mailer against a candidate who's never served in office um, that creates their identity of who they are when they actually don't really have a track record to stand on. And in this race, Sierpoy was the only one who actually had experience. Do you think that's something that voters in SD8, um, you think that appeals to them? Yeah, I, I think it did. I mean, obviously, the Sirpoi name is a household brand over there. You had Connie uh, serve in a really tough district. Uh, I believe she won in 94 against an incumbent. Uh, Mike doesn't run until he's, I believe, kind of semi-retired in 2010. Um, and has run over there, and, and he's just kind of a go-to for people in that region. You know, he's a... Uh, very conservative guy, uh, but he's clear-headed. He's approachable, level hand, level-headed, and so yeah, I think you know he did not run away from his record. Um, you know, really, the the a message that that we ran on a lot, which is kind of interesting given the Kansas dynamic in the region, is the Missouri income tax cut was something that uh, we talked a lot about, and uh, Hillary Shields was very vocal. I think she even called it maybe the Brownback. Searpoy plan, which is you know, kind, of a, kind of a creative approach to it, but um, yeah, I think his record and, and and a guy that you know people just know. I mean, he's out, he's about, he's in the community, uh, and and he's as likable a, a person as you can meet in politics. And so, yeah, I mean, he was a yeah, you know, he was an easy brand to sell. If you're uh, just tuning in, we're here with Joe Lakin, Vice President over at Victory. He's campaign strategist, House former House operative. His fingers in every pie, it seems like, in the Capitol. And we're talking about this special election over in Senate District 8. Uh, going to Mike Searpoy. Um, you had, we were talking about the creative opposition you had. And I'm kind of curious. Do you think this is the new Democratic Party? Do you think this is what Republicans can expect from here on out? Um, yeah, you, you know, maybe. I mean, obviously, you've had, you've had for, uh, you know, I started in Missouri politics in 2008 as an intern, actually, about 50 feet from here. I walked past the office on my way in here, um, where, where I started as a, an intern for Senator Chuck Perguson. And, um, y you know, the, the Republicans have obviously been on offense since then. I mean, you, we've, we've picked up a huge majority. I think we won, uh, 18 or 17 seats in 2010, 2012. You know, it's, it felt like Republicans were going to win back most of the statewide offices, if not all of them. Obviously, you had some unique circumstances here that, that precluded that. Uh, but then you go to 14, another year where Republicans pick up legislative seats. Um, and then obviously 2016, you know, sort of blew, blew open the state for Republicans and, uh, you know, washed out really every Democrat, notable Democrat in the state. Um, and so... You know, Republicans have been on offense, have been aggressive. Um, obviously, President Obama was very unpopular here. Um, certainly, they showed some new signs of life and some, some activities here. I, I just think at the end of the day, um, you know, campaigns matter, candidates matter, uh, but issues matter too. And, and I think until they start nominating more mainstream candidates, um, you know, Hillary Shields ran a, an aggressive race, but she's just out of the mainstream for that region of the state. Um, you know, I think she was called a professional <laughs> protester by uh, by a number of people. Um, you know, you can't contrast with Mike Searpoy anymore. He's a level-headed, approachable guy that gets things done. He's a conservative, right? But uh, And then you've got her who's out with a bullhorn in front of Senator Blunt's office every other week ho hosting die-ins, right? I mean, I don't think that's a, a path back to mainstream success in Missouri. And that's something we kind of talked about yesterday is uh, her statement on Twitter after she lost. Um, she she talks about being progressive. It seems like if Democrats want to win, maybe um, 
in districts like SD8 or districts like HD144, maybe you just don't talk about how progressive you are. We're not really known to be a progressive state in general. No, look, I mean, I, I think it's a, I think it's a, a, a tone deafness, but I, but I also think what you've had happen, uh, and this happened to a certain extent with Republicans in 2010, where, um, y you know, you, you, you lose the presidency, and you think that's a time to kind of unify to go win races, but really the party sort of divided in 2009, 2010 before coming back in a washout with the Tea Party, things like that. Well, what, what you've seen with the Democrats is, you know, it seems to me from where I sit, and, and I'm certainly no expert on local Democrat party politics, but it, it seems like the local apparatus of the party has really been won over by kind of the Bernie Sanders crowd more than the Hillary Clinton crowd. And you're seeing a lot of their candidates, you know, coming from that space. And I, I think Hillary Clinton was a horribly flawed candidate. Um, but but I don't think moving further to the left with a you know a, a, I don't know if he's self-avowed socialist or Democrat I don't know what he calls himself but somebody who's you know free everything for everybody I, I just don't think that's a path back but uh, that that seems to be the well they've been fishing in for now and and I hope that continues. Uh, so we're here with Jill Eakin on the hashtag Mo Ledge podcast sponsored by the lovely St. Louis Regional Chamber of Commerce. Now you're a man who has uh, who's known to have. A really good finger on the pulse of the Republican caucus and something I've noticed um, just since I've been in the Capitol is there's a really strong Republican caucus in the House and throughout the SDA campaign there were dozens and dozens of members in both chambers out there supporting Mike knocking doors um, doing phones that was amazing to see do you think that's one of the reasons Republicans keep finding success and keep growing in this state Without a doubt. Um, you know, I mentioned I started in 2008 and my first paid job in politics, I was sent to Clinton, Missouri to run Scott Largent's state house race there. And, and it was a tough cycle, uh, but we were successful. And, and, you know, working with HRCC, to me, it's the gold standard of you know, political party organizations in the state. Um, you, you know, the, a, a, a cycle budget of north of $4 million every cycle. Um, steady leadership at the helm of it you know you've got guys like uh my business partner dave hageman who was the executive director back in 04 and 06 robert nodell was executive director when i was there he's back there uh you know folks like aaron willard um david willis that have just stuck with the house caucus and so in, in varying roles over the years but um it's a team sport and, and hrcc is a perfect example of the team effort uh you see what, what you saw in the senate race with uh, with folks coming in from all over the state, um, you know, Wes Sutton. I heard heard yesterday's podcast. He's talking about Andrew McDaniel coming from uh, from the boot heel. I mean, that's it's just it doesn't even surprise me anymore. I, I, I was over there a couple weeks ago, and uh, you know, in walked a member from Joplin and two from St. Charles, and it, it 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 doesn't surprise me. And I think if you were if you were at Hillary Shields headquarters, I don't think you'd see. You know, Democrats from all over the state. Now they, they don't have a lot of places to pull caucus members from. I mean, they're basically in Kansas City and St. Louis. Right. But um, you know, it's a team sport, and, and campaigns are tough. And uh, you know, bringing in resources from outside, human resources and otherwise, uh, are essential to success. And and I think that's what you saw here. You know, you saw that in Sarah Walsh's race, members from all over the state coming in. And and I think you'll continue to see that in the special elections in February and next November. And and I think until Democrats figure out, you know, the team nature of this and, and get their organization straightened out, um, I don't see that they're going to have any, uh, you know, any, any, you know, uh, any huge opportunities, uh, even in a tough environment, you'll get beat by a better organization with better candidates. So something I've been thinking about a lot, <clears throat> is there's a lot of politicos who like to speculate that the Republican Party is just getting too big to stay united. But it seems like having such a united team on the campaign side, how will that translate to legislative? Will we see any fractures? What do you think? Well, look, I think, I think any political party that's successful is going to have differences of opinion. That I mean, the nature of it is the broader the constituency, geographic, demographic, uh, ideological, the broader the, the, the interest you represent, the more disagreements you're going to have. And, and, you know, it's easy for people to say, well, we've got these folks that don't support education reform. Why are they in our party? Or, or you've got these people that don't support this issue or that. But, but to me, I've been there for the big issues when we needed 109 
to get an override or, or when we just needed to get there. And, and those, to me, are the reminders of why people are there. When you, you know, override Governor Nixon on a tax cut, that's why all the Republicans who may differ on some issues, that's why they're all in the room and that's why we keep winning them. So, you know, I, I don't think moral victories are worth anything in politics. You don't make policy if you go home. And so to me, you know, I think I think the bigger uh, our majority is the better, uh, even with the governor. I think you, you want to continue to add. You want to, uh, you know, it's kind of a, like a rainy day fund for a caucus. You know, you want to have as many seats as possible to be uh, uh, defending, even though it's nerve-wracking, expensive, timely, costly. Um, I'd much rather have that than a you know caucus in a phone booth. I always think it's interesting looking at you were just talking about geographically how diverse the Republican Party is. Someone told me the other day that Andrew McDaniel is actually closer to the Gulf of Mexico, his district, than Lee Summit. That he apparently can drive down there from the Boot Hill just to the ocean, and he chose Lee Summit. And as a Lee Summit, and I applaud that. <laughs> well, somebody um, once told me that I, I, I never, I should stop repeating it because I don't know if it's true. <laughs> but um, I, I'm pretty sure I heard Senator Logger one time say that he was maybe closer to the Canadian border than he was to the Boot Heel. Probably. <laughs> so I don't know if that's true or not, but, but you guys can repeat it too. <laughs> so you also have a dog in the fight in the House Majority Floor Leader race. Um, that the co Republican caucus will decide on Monday. Um, word on the street. We're here with Joe Lakin on the Hashtag Millage Podcast, sponsored by the St. Louis Regional Chamber of Commerce. Um, Monday, the Republican caucus will meet. They will decide who the next majority floor leader is, now that, obviously, uh, Mike Searboy is now going to be Senator Searboy. Um, we've got Kirk Matthews. Um, how are you feeling? What are you thinking? Um, look, Kirk is, a, Kirk is a dear friend of mine, somebody I think a lot of, not just from you know his work in politics but from his business success from you know from a lot of from his character i mean he's a, he's just a, f a fantastic guy that i think a lot of um you know look I, I i told somebody recently they were asking about leadership races and 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 i told them it's it's sort of like practicing family law you know it's not something you really want to do a lot of uh you know these this, these these caucus races are are sometimes you know sort of personal just like a primary um, but but at the end of the day, you know, this is about getting whoever's best to lead this caucus to continue winning seats, to continue uh, bringing back our members, and to, to continue to pass good conservative public policy. So I, I think Kirk is in a very good position. Uh, headed into Monday, uh, you know, been tireless traveling the state, talking to folks. Um, you know, I've probably visited every coffee shop in the state over the last six months. Um, <laughs> And, and you know, I just think he's a. I think he's a great representative of, of who our caucus is and, and what they stand for. So yeah, I, I think he's probably in a really good spot headed into Monday. So it's time for five questions. Are you ready? I am ready. It's actually going to be six questions. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't sign up for that. <laughs> the first one, I'm going. To, I would like to give you the opportunity to respond to what Wes Sutton said yesterday. It was about, libel. About li it was libel. <laughs> and I, I, I've already communicated with him. Yeah. <laughs> so who actually has the best hair in Missouri politics? Um, if I were to rank him, I'd have to give myself number one. Uh, <laughs> I'd have to give Alex Eaton number two mm. and Wes in third. So we're not even going like, to consider like Brian Grace's hair? Uh, definitely not. No. Why is that? Uh, <laughs> it's just, just a little too pretty for me. <laughs> <laughs> the real five questions now what song do you have completely memorized uh, wagon wheel that is a perfect answer that is, that is a perfect i answer. love me some wagon wheel it concerns me when people don't know that song concerns me when people say it's darius rucker's song too yeah but that's what i was just well, thinking yeah, that was actually my wife and i the song at our wedding was was wagon wheel so like your first dance song uh we didn't really do first dances okay. really I, she was kind of in charge of that I was okay just, right on. i was just there okay very good um, next one, and, and I changed it because you just talked about what is your favorite coffee shop in the state of Missouri? My favorite coffee shop in the state of Missouri. Um, you know, I I would actually probably go with uh, MacArthur's in Kirkwood. We um, we have uh, our office is right down the street from there, and uh, that's kind of our office away from our office, so they know us. Uh, they take good care of us. Although one time, a funny story, uh, we got on to the Wi-Fi one day, and there was theirs was no longer there, and it said go to Caldi's. 
And we were sort of wondering if that was a, a message for us because we kind of squat there. But, uh, <laughs> but we love them nonetheless. <laughs> That's right. savage. And Coffee Zone. Now, I, I always think it's funny and interesting how many miles people in politics put on their cars. And I can't imagine how many are on yours. So if you could, and based on how much time you spend in your car, I'm sure, what would be your dream car? Um, my, you know, I like... I like any sort of large vehicle, uh, you know, we sort of, it's like a, we have like a rolling office down the industry. We also have like four people on there and computers and whatnot. <laughs> so I, I like, uh, I'm, I'm simple. I like, a, you know, a Tahoe or a, a Yukon, something oh, right. like that. Just simple things. Yeah, right. Okay. Now, are we talking like Scott Bond's Hillbilly Heaven Tahoe? Or are we talking about... I don't like... know that I've seen his Hillbilly Heaven <laughs> Tahoe, but I'm probably not talking about that now. <laughs> No. He has, um, I think it's probably got to be like a 94. He Is that calls right? It a, it's like a, he calls it a quote unquote work truck. Um, <laughs> but it's rusted, it's maroon, it has a sticker on the side for his vineyard down in West Butler County. Um, it's got a lot of stickers on the back. Um, I don't know if the seatbelts actually work. I can actually confirm that they do. They do? They okay. do actually. I'm always very uncomfortable whenever I sit in it because I don't know how it works. I was very impressed because I was sure that I was going to die the first time I ever got in there. And <laughs> lo and behold, there's seat belts. That was a shock. And You can only I see through the floorboards in a couple spots. Right. <laughs> is that is that to pedal or or? Uh, yes, probably. Yeah. You Flintstone it. Yeah, right I like now. to think it's for ease of access when you need to escape. <laughs> yeah. So we're, I'm presuming you're not talking. About I I was that. not talking about that, but um, but, but <laughs> so, something like that. <laughs> Last question: What is something that a ton of people are obsessed with that you just don't understand? Um, I would have to say the real housewives it's like todd richardson's wife amber and my wife and others are like on this weird wavelength on it and i just don't really understand it why is it a all. thing i'm always really surprised whenever I, I learn of people that i respect a lot that are actually really into reality tv yeah my and wife would fall in that category i wonder i wonder if it's like a <laughs> complete distraction thing uh, Myself, I like to go to like. I find it like distracting crime too. <laughs> yeah, my, see, my wife doesn't like crime shows. I grew up. I, I, my family also is like into Law and Order, right? Yeah. And if you like Law and Order, um, there's literally no weekend without something entertaining. I mean, it's on 48 hours on the weekend, and so uh, I'm. I like Law and Order. She doesn't like crime shows though. So, uh, which really limits the. Uh, I remember my, um, it was like my second batch of campaigns. There's that like little dead period in between the campaign ending and then like having a real job with yeah. like, benefits. Yeah. And I actually sat down and watched every single season of Law & Order SVU back to back. Yeah. I, that, that's all, that window has always for me been kind of West Wing. But I always start over and I never, I've never watched them all. That's something I would like to watch. You've never watched the entirety of West I have, Wing? I have not. I've seen the first like five seasons probably 30 times but do you watch saturday night live uh no i'm usually asleep okay i'm early um, to bed so it's either snl or mad tv there is a a parody of west wing where they're all dressed up obviously as the characters and they just keep walking faster and faster and faster and eventually they're running and like pushing each other down and sometimes i wait for that to happen in like the missouri capital because people will like be walking beside each other and you know they're kind of going somewhere but they don't really know and they'll walk faster and faster they're not oh, looking they're. at their phones, are they? No, never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, if they're looking at your, their phones, don't you, like, just stick your foot out and just kind of check them? No, because I'm usually looking at my phone. Mm. That's my problem. Phone's a... I'm not looking at my phone. It's usually glued to my... I have fallen on, these, yeah, <laughs> I've fallen on these floors. I would not wish that upon anyone. Surprisingly enough. <laughs> yeah, I forgot how hard these floors are. I, oh, I just vicious. walk through. I, I'm rarely here and... Most of the older LAs in the building, like if you ever just feel like you have time to talk to them about their experiences in the building, um, they've fallen. Like most of them have. Um, I know Kurt Bar's LA actually fell down the front steps out front uh, over by the Thomas Jefferson building. Like I don't know if she sprained it or broke her ankle, but she was on crutches for a while. 
<laughs> and <laughs> she at least has a, a good sense of humor about it. Like, if you're going to fall down a flight of stairs, at least fall at Thomas Jefferson's feet. That, that's fair. You, you can literally tell, like, the toughest people in the state capitol are, like, the women in these tall high heels and the men that wear boots every day. My, my feet would fall off if I wore boots on those floors every day. But Are boots not comfortable? I don't think so. Depends. What Some people boots. say they're very comfortable. I don't find them particularly comfortable. Like, if we're talking cowboy boots, no, I'm not really... Can you just, like, put an insole in there? I don't know. I guess so could, hard. but... I will say, back before I broke my foot violently, um, after my third session here, I, um, <laughs> <laughs> I wear heels a lot. They make, like, special insoles. Yeah. And you can get, like, rubber soles on your shoes so you don't slip and fall. Those are just long days here. Long, long days, days and hard floor. Long days. I'm say, we're rolling sneakers most days. Yeah. I'll be sneakers. Honest. <laughs> You're going to be uh, going to channel the Victor Callahan. Why not? Okay. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we, this was uh, been another episode of the Hashtag Milledge Podcast. We're here today with Joe Lakin talking about special elections and more. Uh, we will be back again on Monday with another very special guest. Um, but thank you so much for listening to the Hashtag Mo Ledge Podcast, sponsored by the St. Louis Chamber of Commerce, and we'll be back next week.